Hey, I'm excited to start this new series uh, that we're in for the next four weeks, entitled uh, The Gift. Uh, And we're going to be dissecting the names of God all throughout uh, in this passage in Isaiah. For some of you which have been with us for the last couple weeks, I know you're like, hey, wait a second, I thought we're in the Sermon on the Mount. It didn't seem like we we finished that. And... uh, (laughs) She's like, yeah. We're like, what happened? Uh, and so we, we paused it uh, for uh, just uh, for this Christmas season, and we'll be picking it back up. Uh, don't worry. We got more words of Jesus that we'll be working through. Would you uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah uh, chapter 9? We're going to be reading from 1 through 7. Um, I, I, I enjoy... Uh, some of you are like, oh man, Pastor Elijah, you, you used to read from the screen or from your, your laptop, and I was like, now I read from the Bible. I just, I just love having the physical Bible in my hand, and quite frankly, if you love Jesus, you will too. Um, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Just joking. I'm not trying to get you guys to get Bibles. I don't know. Maybe. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. That's what the Word of the Lord says. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined, watch this, for burning, will be fuel for fire. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I, I just thank you for these moments that we have together. I thank you, Lord Jesus, in seasons and moments where it may feel hopeless, God, you are there. I ask now, Lord, that you would speak through your servant, that this would not be about how well Elijah can preach a message, Lord, but it would be about your word. And these words, Lord Jesus, that are proclaimed, your goodness that is proclaimed here would not just merely sit in our heads as more head knowledge to accumulate, but it would work its way down into our heart and then from our hearts to our hands and our feet, demanding that we respond for what you have for us in this season. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So I can, I can imagine if you grew up in the church, you'd probably have heard this scripture verse read over you millions of times, especially around Christmas, right? And, and most of you have seen it on ornaments. You've seen it like uh, around uh, Christmas specials and all that the different stuff. But this is what I can also bet. Unless, unless it was communicated to you what was going on, most of you have no idea the context of this verse. It, it sounds very Christmassy. It is the name of Jesus, and we love that stuff, and that's awesome. But, like, let's be honest, most of us are like, what is happening? Most of us, even if we were asked, where, where is this verse found? We'd be like, somewhere in the Old Testament, Right? 
for us to fully grab the context of what's happening here, right, we have to be able to dive into the history because this is what I want you to know. These are real people, right, li- living in real times, and these words matter to them. And because they matter to them, I, this is the thing. Once we understand the context, they will matter even more to us. That we love that there is a Messiah. We love that there's a promised king. But what did that mean to these people? Then we can build the bridge to saying, what does it mean to to us? So, let me give you a little bit of context here. By the time we get to this verse here, the the prophet Isaiah, I I want you to understand something. The, The kingdom of Israel is split in two. There are two kingdoms now. Israel is no longer one. This is after David, after Solomon. And there's been this turning away from God. There's the northern kingdom called Israel. And there's the southern kingdom called uh, Judah here. And what you have to understand is that uh, in this time, the, the children of Israel had moved away from following Yahweh, from, and they started uh, operating like the other nations. They started worshiping other idols. In fact, we know that at some point it got so chaotic that they started bringing other idols into the temple of God. Now, I want to pause right there because this is a big deal. Uh, if you were with us here earlier in the year, we went through, I think it was a nine to ten week study through the book of Exodus. And we talked about how Yahweh had basically uh, brought uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. This is one of the most important stories. Listen, if you want to understand the Bible, there there are a couple big stories that you have to understand. You're going to have to understand the Genesis story, what's happening there, and then you need to understand the Exodus story. If you don't, you're going to be confused all throughout the New Testament because the New Testament writers are going to bring this up over and over again. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, it continues to point back to the story of Egypt, right? Because Jesus is called what? The greater... Moses, yes, you've been here with me. Good job. Way to make me look good in front of my parents, guys. And and so the children of Israel have been brought through this messianic figure here, this deliverer, Moses here, and they've brought him through Egypt to to the, the promised land. And so God has one rule. He really has kind of like one big idea. Serve me. Right? Don't serve other gods. And you will be my chosen people. You will be the city on a hill, a light in the midst of darkness. And the nations outside will get to know who I am by seeing how you operate, that you operate differently. By the time we get to the the prophets here, they they are communicating this idea over and over and over again throughout the text that the children of Israel have turned away. And actually, they're operating like the other nations. They're being cruel. They are harming foreigners, and they're pushing down the poor. Like this, this is the context of this verse. And God, God is telling the prophets to, to communicate to his people, you have to turn from the way that you're acting, the way that you're operating. Come back to me. And over and over again, they continue to turn away from God. They choose their way of doing things. If that wasn't bad enough, in the, the north, there is this, there's this empire that's been growing. I want to show you a map right now. This is called the, the Empire of Assyria. And so that dark green uh, part right there is, is, the, is the empire before, as it's trying to start expanding. It, it really was, uh, it existed uh, between 900 to 609. For some of you which are like, hey, I don't remember history class, why are we going down? Because this is before the common era. It is a countdown to the common era, which is, which is uh, set into place by Jesus' birth, Okay. So, so this is this, this moment, and they, and they end, by the end of their time, they're going to have all of this light green area. 
At this moment, the Assyrians are now trying to move down, uh, uh, down alongside the middle of the Tigris and, and Mesopotamia to continue expanding their, uh, their, their community. They see the Babylonians there that they, they want to go ahead and, and take over. The Babylonians later on will end up taking over this, this whole area, and, and, and they want to get down to Egypt. But to get down to Egypt, guess what you have to go through? The northern and the southern kingdom. That means you have to conquer these, these people which are along the coast. So I want to pause right there. So now here's the context, right? The children of Israel already are, are turned away from God. They're already in conflict. And now there is this empire which is out here, which is coming and descending. And when they descend, they want to take over everything and not just take over everything. They, they want you to worship the way that they worship. They want you to assimilate you into their system. Any Trekkies out here? Do you guys remember the Borg? I'm the only nerd? Okay, whatever. Right? The, the Borg was going throughout the cosmos trying to do what? It was trying to assimilate everyone into the Borg to, to behave the same way. This is how you take control of a community. And so God had already chosen these people and said, no, you're supposed to be different. And so, so this is the context that, that is happening right here in the text. And Isaiah is born here during this 8th century uh, period. And, and he's going to prophesy from about 740 to about a 700 B.C. And there's going to be different kings here and different prophets which are going to be prophesying. If you want to follow this timeline, this is why I love the Bible, is because it's not just a, 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 a recorded, just a straightforward. Like there are books that, that follow along with the history. Uh, First and Second Kings give you the background of, of what is happening here. And, and so there are these different kings. He's prophesying during the time of Uzziah, in, in Jotham, in Ahaz, and in Hezekiah. And, and he's telling them, hey, you, are, you guys are behaving like the other nations. Now, I want you to think about this. B because, right, there is the pain that is happening eternally. There is the fear of this empire which is going to come down from the north and is going to sweep through and, and basically destroy everything. How would you feel? See, for, for us here who, who live in the Western context, this, this probably isn't a big deal for you. But if I were to raise you up out of your context right now and I place you in Ukraine, right? And you have Russia, which is, which is bearing down on you every day. And now you have to think about, am I going to survive? How am I gonna, if you have children, how am I gonna feed my children? Are my children going to survive? That's already bad enough as it is. But if you, if you have a little bit of wealth, you're able to move out of that situation. You're able to, to move forward. But imagine now if you are the poorest or the lowest, lowest in this society, how they feel how they're, they're maneuvering, how this feels like a hopeless situation to them. And they're being hurt by their own people. Because remember, the ancient uh, Near East is a stratified world. That, that simply just means it's, a, it's built on classes. So if you're wealthy or you're royal, you're at the top. If you're lower economically or you're a slave, you're at the bottom. And so you're feeling more pressure than everybody else on this class system. This feels hopeless. And these, this is the context right here that these words sit and lie in. This is the context with, with, with the coming destruction. And it was going to come. God had let loose because the children of Israel had turned away from God. And God said, okay, I will leave you to your own devices. with the inconsistency and in, with the way that they were behaving in Israel. This is what's happening. And Isaiah, Isaiah prophesies these words to a rebellious people, to an idolatrous people, to, 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 to about the, the coming judgment of God. But then he says, hey, there is a gift that will come to us. 
in the midst of our foolishness, not because of us, but because God is rich in mercy. He is wonderful. He is kind. There is a gift, and it will be in the form of this Messiah figure who will come and rescue us just like, remember, we were rescued before in Egypt. And this is what the gift's name is going to be. He's going to be mighty king. He's going to be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And to his government, there will be no end. This week, I really want us to dive around this idea of what does it mean? Because as we, we, we think about this, these are all characteristics of the Messiah. What does it mean for God to be the wonderful counselor? Because for us, we have to make that bridge. Remember, what did it mean for them? And so now what does it mean for us? And so what does it mean in the face of all of that for Jesus to be the Messiah, to be the wonderful counselor? And this is what I think. I think for as Jesus, who we know is is who the, the scriptures are prophesying about, is that this wonderful counselor, Jesus, offers us a counsel to those whose hearts are troubled and chaotic. He offers counsel to those whose hearts are troubled and chaotic. We, we live in a world where there is wars and rumors of wars on the constant. All you have to do is turn on the news. I, I, I watch the news from time to time to stay informed. I, I, I love geopolitical stuff. And so it's always hard trying to figure out like who's actually telling the truth because a lot of this is all propaganda and, 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 and moving pieces. But just the other day, I don't know if you were paying attention, Russia moved down their, their level of, uh, uh, for nuclear warfare, to be able to use nuclear arms. And, and if your heart is not steadfast in Jesus, man, even those of us whose hearts are steadfast in Jesus, that sounds scary, nuclear warfare? There is, it seems like the world is going crazy right now more than any other time. There's deaths and violence and disease and poverty that is all around us if we would just open our eyes. The problem with the, the children of Israel, that some of them were not opening their eyes to what was going on. This feeling that the walls are coming down. I don't know about you, like whenever I like to go, I, I, I like to travel and uh, me and my wife love to go and eat. And it's, it's funny when we go and eat, we go to these places and it's so beautiful. But the more place I trouble, travel, I see uh, more homelessness and the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And it literally breaks my heart. Sometimes like, man, the Lord has really been putting on my heart as I'm walking into this like beautiful restaurant, knowing that there's people and ch- children which are not even having the opportunity to eat. And all I can think about is scarfing down this thing or putting this food on Instagram. Like, we have to, we have to be aware that there's a world out there that feels hopeless. There's a world out there that feels like it's bearing in on us. And, and it, and, and, and for some, they just feel despair. They feel chaos at their fingertips because right now you can see violence of every kind. You can see disparity of every kind just at your fingertips. All you have to do is pick up your phone. That's what technology has offered us. And even in the season you would think that with the holidays, all of this would be subsided from our heart. But actually, uh, that we know that, that there's studies being done that actually the holiday times is one of the worst times for people uh, mental health-wise. A survey was done in 2023 by the American Psychology Association. It found that 89%, I'm going to say it again, 89% of U.S. adults feel stressed during this holiday season. of Americans, 41% reporting higher stress levels compared to other times of the year. Stress, which can lead to physical illness, depression, anxiety, substance abuse. In fact, we know statistically that this is one of the highest times 
in, in, in our country, this first world nation where, where people statistically even take their lives. As we're singing and rejoicing, there's people who feel the hopelessness of this world. And so this is what they do. This is what they do, right? They, they turn to other things to numb the pain, to turn down the volume of what is happening in their hearts. So it's the same old thing, right? It's sex, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's food, it's work, it's money. You just pick it. What is your vice that you run to, right, to feed whatever this, this happening in the chaos of your heart, to numb out whatever's happening out there, around us? This, this feeling of hopelessness. And here's the thing that we all know to be true. We were not meant to live like this. We were not meant to live like this. And all of us who call on the name of Jesus know that God did not create us to be like this. The people in that day and time are living in the chaos of, 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 of in any moment the Syrians could descend and destroy. And so what do they start doing? They start making choices to numb themselves and they start turning to other uh, countries, right? And, 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 and tying together allegiances together to be able to push back the Assyrian armies. But here was the only problem. They weren't turning to God. Isn't it interesting when we're going through situations and we feel the chaos around us and all that swirling that the first thing that we want to do is like, I, 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 can, I can fix it. Isaiah says, no, there's, there's somebody who can fix the imbalance that's happening in our heart, and it is the wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor here uh, is, is a special word. You have to understand that in the ancient Near East, they, they use words specifically uh, on purpose, right? We say things like, um, I ate this hot dog the other day. It was wonderful, that, that is a watered-down version of the, that, that word. It was amazing. It's like, was it amazing? It was a hot dog, you know? Um, but actually, when, when we look at it in context, in the scriptures, uh, the word wonderful here can really be communicated as incomprehensible. That it is, it is beyond understanding. And God is saying here that, that the one who gives counsel is incomprehensible. I say it's, it's incomprehensible. That we, it's beyond our understanding. And he desires for us to not allow ourselves to fill our hearts with all this stuff to numb us. But he actually has the cure to what ails us. And I I love the way that New Testament writers look back at passages like this. And as they see Jesus, this is what they do. They they describe him and they communicate what what Jesus wants to do in his own words back to us. How, How do we know that? Go to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Listen to Jesus's words here as he's talking to these people and he's, he's trying to communicate his heart. This is what he says. He says, come to me all who are what? Weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Listen to what this wonderful counselor's idea, his desire for you is. He says that he will give you rest. He says, take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your what? Soul. Let me pause right there because, again, it is really easy to see that word souls, right? And then uh, the the Greek word there, suke, and you'll think, oh, my goodness, right? They're talking about a trichotomy, right? Like mind, body, and spirit, right? Like that's the way that we've been taught. That's more Greek. The word souls here in its original context, in the Jewish context, is talking about the wholeness of a person. They don't separate it like the way we do. That came so much later on. They're saying that all of who you are, your whole being. So, so, So look at it again, right? 
For, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for what? Your whole being. This is what the wonderful counselor is trying to invite you into. That you will find rest for all of who you are. Not just for some of who you are. Not just for a part of who you are. Not just for a spiritual, ethereal thing, right? Like so that like, I can be heavenly minded, but, but no earthly good. No, but for all of who you are, Jesus invites us into. For your, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, Notice, Jesus is not saying that you will never have issues or trials. Notice, Jesus is not saying that if you come to me, right, your burden will be so easy that everything will be okay. No, he's saying when you go through storms in your life, when you go through the, the chaos, when it feels like everything is about to collapse on you, you will find rest for your souls. This is Jesus' invitation as the good counselor. See, Christ's position is that he wants to guide you. He, he wants to guide you, but here's the only problem, right? We are at war. Just like the children of, of, of Israel were at war, and so we tend to say, okay, what is the best way I can come out of this? One of my favorite writers, he was a philosopher, uh, an amazing Christian. His name is Dallas Willard. He, he coined this phrase. He said, uh, it talked about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of me. He said, the kingdom of God is where what God wants to happen happens, but the kingdom of me is where what I want to happen happens. And so this is what I know. When chaos comes, we choose how can I best protect my own kingdom, right? How, how can I fix it? Because my, my kingdom is losing ground. And instead of allowing the king to be the person that we go to, all of us, right, there's a situation, okay, something's going on with my job. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to go on LinkedIn because I got to fix it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I wonder if the children of Israel, when they were going through chaos, the first thing that they did, and this is what the prophets were saying, is go to God. Do you pray? My marriage is on the rocks. Is the first thing that I'm doing going to prayer, or am I trying to find a book? Am I calling a friend to talk about this? Am I, like, what is the first thing? See, that's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of me. And the children of Israel found themselves in this situation and constantly they went to others trying to figure out backdoor deals with people which were so anti-God and he continued to pollute and they, they started to behave in a way that was antithetical to everything that the scriptures, everything that God was. And church, we do the same thing. We don't find ourselves on our knees praying, okay, Lord, I need you. How can I fix it? And listen, I'm not saying that at some point we don't do that. I'm saying you left God out of the equation. Yet he's supposed to be master, yet he's supposed to be savior. Paul tells us in Galatians what happens when we do that. This is the trajectory when we take our own counsel, when we decide, right, that we are going to uh, uh, skip God in the process, just like the children of Israel did, and we're going to go to all these other things that seem to make sense. I, I want to give it to you. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. I want to give it to you in the message version. Uh, Eugene Peterson has a paraphrase where he, he, he writes, uh, and I think he draws the feeling of what's happening here. This is what he says. This is what happens when you take your own counsel. It says it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless, grabs of happiness, uh, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants a brutal temper, temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habits of, de, 
uh, depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. Watch this. This isn't the first time I've warned you. You know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. When we decide to take our own counsel and we don't start with God, we will find ourselves in these chaotic situations. And what, is, what we're saying is that we don't trust and believe in this big God. Yet, here it is, if you're taking notes, here's the second one. Our wonderful counselor, it fully understands what we are going through. We don't have a counselor that's, that doesn't understand our behalf. We're not trusting that he's not there for us. How do we know that? Let's go ahead and turn really quickly to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And this is what the author says about this God. Listen, here is what he says. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold a Firmly to the faith we, what? Profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, what? Empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. One translation says with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our every time of need. Here it is. This is what I'm trying to communicate to you is that Christ put on flesh and he lived like us and he was tempted and tried like us. So when he goes before the father, when you're going through your situation, he says, I know what they've gone through. When the Spirit is trying to move you in a certain direction, trying to cause you to be patient and not take up, uh, your, uh, take up and do things your way, he's, he's saying it because he knows what you're going through. He's felt the anxieties of life. He's felt the pressures of life. H- how do we know that? Let's go back to the Scriptures, right? Jesus is at Gethsemane. He, he, his, all of his life and ministry and, and, and his earthly form has now come to this moment. And, and the Bible says he, he's there praying on the side. He has his closest disciples with them, Peter, James, and John. And they've fallen asleep on him multiple times. He's about to take on the weight of past, present, and future in this moment. And the Bible says he's, he's sitting there like praying. And and he's sweating, and it becomes like drops of blood. Can you imagine the anxiety that is going through your body in that moment? And everything in him is saying, do it your way. Choose your kingdom. The children of Israel did it. Everybody else did it. And this is what he says. Not my will, but what? Your will be done. See, the counselor's been in that moment that you've been in. And so when he's saying, wait, trust in the Father's plan, he has had to trust in the Father's plan. If Jesus had to do that, why do we then take on our own counsel? Why do we move ahead of God? Jesus lived the life that we lived. And he has grace for us, even when we fail, because he understands. And that's the counsel that he wants to give to us as one that overcame every obstacle. And I love the way Isaiah says it. That counselor, that king, that Messiah of his greatness, of his greatness, of his government and peace, there will be no end. There there will be No end. You see, this is the gift that was promised to a group of people that were hopeless, that you may go through this situation, but if you would just wait and trust in God, that you will overcome. That that you will overcome. Stop moving ahead of God. This was the cry of the prophets. And here's my cry for our church today. Let's stop moving ahead of God. 
But pastor, I prayed. I prayed before the Lord and it didn't happen. How come? And most of us don't know that if we're not hearing it, maybe we're supposed to stay praying. We want what's instant. We want it right now. We want it on our terms. But that maybe God is trying to shape and mold us because he understands more than we do. Here it is. Last thing, that Jesus' counsel comes with wisdom to restore order in our lives. It's very simple. Jesus' counsel comes with wisdom to restore order in our lives. You see, Jesus is looking at things in a different way than we could ever think or imagine. In fact, Isaiah, as you go uh, to Isaiah chapter 55, now the children of Israel are in exile. They, they have now been taken over. They're fully been displaced from the land, chapter 55. And he's talking to these group of people which are thirsting and hungering after the righteousness of God to be, to, to, for God to speak to them because they're in exile. They're displaced. And this is what he says to them. He says, listen to what the wise counselor says to them. For your, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts, your thoughts. Here it is. He is given a picture. He's not literally saying the, the, the skies and the ground. He's saying, do you see the chasm between the skies and the ground? That represents how differently we, I am thinking and you are thinking. I know past, present, and future. And if you would trust me in this moment, instead of moving in front, maybe then maybe you won't find yourself in more destruction. Trust that I know that I have what's best for you in your heart. Stop moving in front of me. Stop making choices without me. If you would trust me, my thinking is different than yours. I want to counsel you in that. But that might mean sitting in the midst of this murky storm and instead of feeling the tension of I have to do something, saying, no, I'm going to wait. You know, before I came here, it's funny, my parents are here, so we were having a little bit of a conversation about uh, this. And I remember my time in Buffalo, uh, I planted a church. I was on staff for a while, helped my dad plant a church before that. And my, par my, my parents, both my, my, my dad and my mom, and uh, helped them plant a church. And then I, I was on staff at a church. And then I went to go plant my own church. And I was so excited. This was the dream of my heart. And man, I plant the church. I have all spiritual forces of darkness kind of descend on me. I was called name by pastor, names by pastors that I had never met before. Our, our core group of a church, which I think at some, at some point was like close to almost 60, was disintegrated in, the la in two months, two months right before we started the church. So I, I moved into this church with eight people from all, having more than 65 people on our core group. And then we finally get it going. The church gets up to 100. We shrink it back down to 20. I was a really good pastor. And then, like, we're, we're going, and it's growing again, and it's growing again. And then, all of a sudden, COVID comes. COVID comes, and it displaces everything. And I find myself, this is the beginning of COVID, I find myself in the hospital. And this is the, during the days that nobody quite knew what was going on. And all I knew that there were, there were people that were dying, and I'm in this ward, and there's people. My wife is, uh, we just had our son, Justice. I think he was about two years old or, or, or so, a little bit older than that. And my daughter, was, my, my, my daughter was, uh, my wife was still pregnant with my daughter. And all I can think is, I'm not going to get to see my daughter be born. I'm not going to get to see my children grow. And just thinking like, I'm going to die here. I'm, I make it out of that, that space. And, and then uh, uh, we're going and then nothing is ever the same. The church landscape changed. And so literally the dream I had been crying and, and praying for, my, my parents are right here, they know, I saw it disappear in seconds. I remember going to the church and I remember uh, we had just bought this building, which I was like, we had just got it is a warehouse and I'm probably gonna have to give it up. We spent, raised so much money to get it. 
And I remember sitting in, the, in, the, in that space and I started just weeping before God. And this is not, not cute prayers. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. First of all, can I tell you something? To all of you who think like you can't be honest with God, he already knows. You might as well be honest with your prayers. And I was just, I was sitting in that space yelling at him, you told me to do this. You called me to do this. It seems like everything has broken. Just weeping and praying and asking God why. It felt like we finally got got it going and now everything is disintegrating. And you want to know what my answer was? Nothing. And day in and day out, instead of me saying, okay, I'm going to do my own thing, I said, God, I'm going to wait on you. And one day I heard this faint voice, God saying, this is where I wanted you. Today I'm, I'm, I was coming in and I brought in our, our fire stuff uh, and I brought it to the, the front in a second. You guys are going to, with your kiddos and uh, even your adults, because I know y'all like s'mores. You're going to be able to go roast them outside. I was shaking people's hands. I was uh, joking with Nate about Michigan, whooping Ohio State. I was, I was rejoicing with him. Don't think I cheered more for a team than I've ever had that, that day. Um, and uh, hugged a couple of people. Got to pray with some people. Thinking about how we got to love on Miss Cindy. And remembered that that waiting where I thought that God wasn't moving, he was preparing me for this. In the backside of the desert where I didn't think God was speaking, he was preparing me for this. To be a part of this community, for this community to love me, and for me to love this community. You see, sometimes the good counselor's wisdom is beyond our thinking as far as the heavens are from the earth, and he is preparing you in this moment. And instead of you moving before God, maybe if you sit still and know that God is there. We want fast answers all the time, but maybe God is trying to cultivate your hearts so that in this next season, as you're in the storm, instead of you being king of your own heart, he can prepare you for what next season you're coming to. Instead of going into it unprepared. If I had not gone through that, I would not be able to serve rightly now. That's what the scriptures are calling us to. Would you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, you who are our wonderful counselor, I pray. I pray that if there are people in this room that feel the urge to move before you, that they would slow down. That feel the urge to to create, to numb themselves with with easy, easy things, Father God. That they would say no to it. And they would find peace in the stillness and the waiting, knowing that we have a wonderful counselor. And they would learn to open their ears to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stretch your hands out?